Cell membranes are very important. Uh, they've been around for about 4 billion years since the very first cells on Earth were developed at the early stages of the evolution of life. Uh, the cells became more important, but the key characteristic of cells is that they're surrounded by um, uh, an envelope that seals them from the outside world. So the key function of the cell membrane is to separate the inside of the cell, which is controlled by life processes, from the outside of the cell, which is the environment. And then uh, through time, uh, different functions of the cell membrane have evolved to give the cell the ability to cope in the big world. Uh, so for many years it wasn't known uh, what the cell membrane was made of, other than that it's a barrier between the inside and the outside of the cell. But about, oh, probably about 100 years ago now, uh, originally, um, Gorter and Grendel studied the red blood cell in the human body and extracted from the cell um, the fats, the lipids, that are now known to be one component of the membrane. And they showed that there's enough lipid molecules in the membrane of a cell to make two complete layers covering the cell. And that was the origin of what was the original lipid bilayer uh, theory of the cell, which is that uh, it's made up of largely uh, lipid molecules, which have a hydrophobic, that means um, a water repelling end to them, and then a hydrophilic, a water loving end. So the, the hydrophobic is fat, the hydrophilic is sugars and phosphates and things like that. So you have this um, molecule, the lipid, that has um, a hydrophobic and a hydrophilic end and they pair together to form a bilayer. The lipid bilayer surrounds the cell. And for quite a while that was most of what was known about the cell membrane. But about half of the matter in cells is also made up of protein. Uh, so it's protein and lipid. And, and so about 1935, Davston and Danielli uh, uh, enhanced this original theory of the lipid bilayer uh, and thought, hypothesized, that the membrane was made up of a lipid bilayer with protein on each surface. And that again stood for a while until in the mid-70s, um, Singer and Nicholson came up with a more sophisticated model, and that is our current view of, membrane of cell membranes and, and, and their structure. And it was called the fluid mosaic model. And in this model, the membrane is a two-dimensional fluid in which lipids flow around as a bilayer, and then um, interspersed among the lipid, there are protein molecules essentially diffusing and floating around in the lipid. Some of these protein molecules are loosely attached to the outside, some on the inside, but some go completely through the membrane. And actually Mark Brecher, uh, who is in the MRC, Laboratory of Molecular Biology at the time, he was the first one to show uh, two different membrane proteins, again in the red blood cell, could span the membrane from the inside to the outside. He labelled it with different uh, chemical labels and showed it span the membrane. And these two proteins, glycophorin, and BAN3 is, is their nickname. Uh, BAN3 transports um, ions across the membrane. Glycophorin simply acts as a tag for the sugar. And that was the first time then that it was known that you have the lipid bilayer, you have the proteins associated with it, but this showed how the proteins were associated with it. And then mid 70s to mid 80s, people started to study uh, the proteins and how they uh, how they are incorporated into the membrane. And, and our work, that's um, work that I did with Nigel Unwin uh, back in 1975, uh, we, we, were, we determined the very first uh, low resolution structure of a membrane protein called bacteria rhodopsin. And then about 10 years later, uh, there was another membrane protein structure, um, the reaction centers from uh, bacteria or green plants which absorb light and uh, convert that light energy into other forms of cellular energy. And so with those two membrane protein structures you had a real image uh, 
of the protein structure with uh, the polypeptide chain. Proteins are made up of a polypeptide. The uh, polypeptide crosses the membrane back and forward in the form of a helical structure. That's the alpha helices that Linus Pauling had hypothesized back in 1950 and had been found in myoglobin, the very first protein structure, but not in a membrane. So now we've gone from knowing the structures of some non-membrane proteins to now knowing the structure of the first two uh, membrane protein structures. And then with time, our understanding of uh, the nature of the cell membrane has uh, become more detailed. And so now we know, for example, that the lipid molecules, uh, which before were just a generic class, we know partly from Mark Brecher's work, but partly from subsequent work, that all the glycolipids, that means these fatty uh, hydrophilic hydrophobic molecules um, that have a sugar molecule on it, glycolipid means having a sugar molecule, those lipids are all on the outside, facing the outside world. And then on the inside, you have acidic or uh, zwitterionic, that means they have two charges, positive and negative, facing the inside. And then similarly, there are now known thousands of membrane. Each one has a different structure and the membrane proteins have a different function. Um, so there are multiple um, different functions in the membrane, each one um, catalyzed or uh, uh, activated as by a, a little molecular machine, which is either the protein molecule or a complex of protein molecules. So all of the multiple functions of the membrane, sensing the outside world, or transporting um, small molecules inside or outside the membrane or signaling to the outside world. Each one of the functions of the, of the proteins in the membrane, which help the cell to communicate and interact with the outside world, um, they are performed by all these different protein molecules. And then with time, as life evolved from single-celled organisms up through higher eukaryotes, um, many different types of specialized membrane uh, evolved uh, under Darwinian natural selection evolution. And in, in a normal cell, for example, in a human or in a eu other eukaryotic organism, there are many different types of membranes that, uh, that characterize the different uh, substructures in the cell. For example, there is the nucleus, it has a membrane, the nuclear membrane. There are the mitochondria, which are the energy center of the cell. They produce ATP. They have two different membranes. And it's, in fact, it's thought that mitochondria uh, and chloroplasts, two uh, subcellular organelles, it's thought that they are both derived from the capture of an early type of bacteria by other single-celled organisms. So you have what's called the endosymbiont theory and everybody believes this now. So that's two of the organelles, but there's also the endoplasmic reticulum, where uh, molecules are synthesized on ribosomes and are secreted or put in the membrane or put into the cytoplasm. And then through the, um, the Golgi apparatus, through lysosomes and secreted to the outside world. So now you have a much richer understanding of how cell membranes work based on specific proteins that are put there under genetic control from the DNA and allow the cell to have its normal function and interact with the outside world. I think that's a reasonably good overview of cell membranes. One interesting question is, uh, what is the difference between um, the membranes that surround cells, which would be a single membrane, and the, membrane that, the membranes that form the compartments within cells? And there are probably you know, 10 or a dozen uh, well-characterized different types of membranes. Um, and of course, each one of them could be the topic of another lecture. But let me just give a, a brief summary of them. So in the beginning, there would be uh, single-celled organisms with a single membrane communicating with the outside world. Um, as uh, life evolved, uh, many of these bacteria developed uh, a double membrane. So you have, a, for example, in bacteria, you have an inner membrane and an outer membrane. The inner membrane usually carries out all of the, um, the most complicated and 
difficult to engineer activities of the cell, transporting, recognition, signaling, and so on. The outside membrane, by contrast, is often um, a protective layer to protect it against it. So it has a, uh, a cell wall or an outer membrane that isn't so complicated in its function, but is acting as a, as a buffer to screen the cell from adverse conditions outside. That would be in a bacterium. You then uh, go to higher forms of life, multicellular organisms, and there you have tissues and cells and organelles and so on. Many different organelle types, like kidney cells, liver cells, the cells in the retina, brain cells, neurons. And each one of those cells will, will, will have a different organization. But in uh, many eukaryotes, um, there is a, a similar underlying structure. Uh, the nucleus, um, uh, mitochondria and chloroplasts in uh, energy production or in plants that are responsible for a large part of the, uh, the energy budget, producing and consuming the energy in the cells. Um, so mitochondria and chloroplasts are specialized organelles that are, uh, have a particular function. And again, each one of those has an inner and an outer membrane. Um, and you could have a lecture about how mitochondria work, but generally they, they absorb nutrients, metabolize them, produce ATP, and then ATP is the molecule that is a chemical store of energy that is the commonly called the, the sort of energy currency of the cell. So when it goes out into the cytoplasm and is used by the uh, many different functions of the cell, ATP has the a phosphate group on the end of the molecule cleaved off. It becomes ADP, which is then uh, imported back into the mitochondria uh, re-energized and sent back out. So a mitochondria have an ADP, ATP uh, translocase that is exchanging and, and charging up the cell. So the, energy, the mitochondria are producing all the energy in the cell. Chloroplasts, on the other hand, are absorbing light and then they are uh, converting that into initially a membrane potential, which is then converted again into ATP, which goes out into the cell. And then in eukaryotic cells, you have the nucleus containing all the DNA, the nuclear membrane separates the nucleus from the cytoplasm. So the, the DNA is transcribed into RNA, that goes out into the cytoplasm. It's translated by the ribosome into proteins that are either secreted into the cytoplasm or through the endoplasmic reticulum, a sort of uh, another membrane structure that's in the cytoplasm. Uh, and in the endoplasmic reticulum in eukaryotic cells, the proteins are either put into the membrane or secreted through into the interior of the endoplasmic reticulum. And, and there, via the Golgi and various vesicles, they eventually end up outside the cell. So there's a secretion pathway uh, that uh, is um, organized by a series of different membranes. And in each and all of these different membranes, you have different proteins that give uh, each of the membranes their character. And what is not known and this is one of the future secrets that, uh, let's say, young scientists wishing to win a Nobel Prize might like to aim for. We do not know quite what it is that makes the Golgi apparatus into the Golgi, the endoplasmic reticulum into the endoplasmic reticulum. But it's a self-organizing system for which there is a uh, missing theory that uh, a lot of the cell biologists, neurobiologists in this laboratory, as well as in other parts of the world, are quite interested to try to understand. This is, this is in the area of cell memories, is probably the one uh, big problem that is not solved. Exactly what is it in each cell that gives each type of membrane its particular characteristic? Obviously, once it's, uh, once it's um, constructed, it's synthesized, we know how it works, we know the proteins in them, but what it is that controls, uh, how is it that the endoplasmic reticulum remains endoplasmic reticulum? How does the cell membrane remain cell? How does the Golgi remain? That is an unsolved problem. And so that's something for the future.